Welcome everyone uh, to our New Testament survey class. I forgot to wish you all in the previous class, but I hope you all all had a good Easter uh, and uh, were able to celebrate well. Um, so before we begin, okay, let's just open with prayer and then I'll um, address, I was supposed to post the video, I know, so I'll just talk about that. But if somebody can open us in prayer, please. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we once again thank you for this uh, time of study. As we get into your word, Father, we pray that uh, you lead us, Lord, in your word and let your word um, bring truth and revelation to our, in our lives, Father. We we pray that whatever we study, we'll be able to retain and apply the same in our lives, Father. And we pray for a blessing upon our entire faculty and all the students here in the Bible College. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Uh, thank you. So um, I was supposed to post a video last week, um, but I wasn't able to do that. Um, we had a sudden death in our family. So um, I'll post it this week. Um, so today we'll just cover first and second Thessalonians. And then I'll, um, if I'm able to post before Thursday, or otherwise I'll post on Thursday or Friday, most likely, uh, I'll post the video that I was supposed to post last week. OK? Um, and I'll let you all know once I post it. So today, let's just look at First and Second Thessalonians. Okay, so um, I believe this is the first slide. Yeah. Okay, so we'll uh, first begin by just looking a little bit at the city of Thessalonica. Uh, so um, it's still a present day city in Greece, known as Salonica. Um, very, very beautiful because it's on the coast. Uh, and in the time of uh, the New Testament, it was also uh, because it was near the port, uh, because it was near the coast, sorry, it had a harbor and a port. So there was a lot of trade happening um, and a lot of uh, people who lived there were uh, either wealthy and prosperous or it was just a very commercial place because they were dealing with trade all the time. So uh, you see a wide range of people from uh, people who were merchants, traders, uh, to people who were very rich, uh, all in uh, the city of Thessalonica. So Paul fits in well there as uh, someone who's also uh, working on the side of doing ministry uh, and he's able to take his uh, work and also be uh, and also able to minister at the same time there um, it was also a place of military importance okay so uh, because of where it was located uh, and it was such an important place that it was called uh, the lap of the Roman Empire uh, by uh, someone named Cicero, who was a Roman. Uh, he's a very famous Roman uh, uh, philosopher and lawyer and statesman. And so he had uh, talked about the inhabitants of uh, Thessalonica uh, as being so blessed or so spoilt, uh, whatever the word you want to use is, uh, but that they were like they were right in the lap of the Roman Empire. Um, and the population was about 100,000. I think your textbook says 200,000. Um, but you can just make that uh, correction. Uh, but it was a large city basically uh within the city and just outside the city walls the total population would have come up to about a hundred thousand uh people 
so it was the province of Macedonia. Now, um, we looked last week at the book of Philippians. And uh, Philippi is also another city in Macedonia. So when Paul uh, has the vision of the Macedonian calling him to uh, come to Macedonia, the first city they land in is Philippi. And then from Philippi, they go to Thessalonica. Uh, so this is the second city in Europe that they visit during their uh, missionary journey. Um, so it was also a very important city because it was connected to Rome through a highway. And uh, although it was under the Roman Empire, it still retained a lot of Greek culture uh, because it was before that under the Greek Empire. Um, so we'll just look first at Acts 17, 1 to 10, to read about uh, what happened when Paul, Silas, uh, Timothy, and Luke land in Thessalonica. So Acts 17, 1 to 10. Someone can read that for us. Acts 17, 1 to 10. Now, when they had passed through Amphiolus and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. Where they were, there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, This Jesus, whom I preach to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded, and a great multitude of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women, joined Paul and Silas. But the Jews, who were not persuaded, became becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason and sought to bring them out of the people, to the people. But when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turn the world upside down, have come here too. Jason has harbored them, and these are all acting contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying, there is another king, Jesus. And they troubled the crowd and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. So when they had taken security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. Then the brethren immediately sent Paulus, Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the synagogues of the Jews. OK, so uh, this is the first uh, entry of the gospel into Thessalonica. So it gives us a background uh, to what was the start of the church. Uh, some of the things we read was there were some Jews who responded to the gospel. There were many. Greeks, right? A large number of Greeks and prominent women who came to faith uh, through the preaching. But the Jews uh, who were jealous or who didn't come to faith started to oppose the work that they were doing. And this is when Paul and Silas uh, leave Thessalonica and go to Berea. Um, so once they go to Berea, they begin to preach there. Uh, but at the same, uh, while they're preaching there, these uh, Jews follow them to Berea and start to cause trouble for them there as well. So um, we see here that uh, in Thessalonica, the Jews were very, very, uh, very um, passionate about whatever they believed and very quick to come against the work that Paul was doing. Uh, so when we read the book of First Thessalonians, we'll understand uh, how that aspect of the Jews being against the gospel applies to the church as it continues to grow. OK, so we'll uh, go into the book. Um, so we know Paul is the author. We see that in uh, 1, 1 and 2.18. Um, 1, 1 says, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, grace and peace to you. So right there, we have both the author and the recipients who are the, the, the Thessalonians, the Church of Thessalonica. Um, and we see here Paul adding 
if you remember last week uh, when we looked at uh, Philippines and Colossians, uh, we saw Paul adding Timothy in his letters. He said Paul and Timothy to the church. Uh, now we see that he's also included Silas, uh, probably because Silas was with him when he went to Thessalonica uh, to preach the gospel. So the letter is uh, written by Paul, but he includes Silas and Timothy uh, in the in the greeting in the beginning. Um, we also see in chapter 2, verse 18, a reference to himself. Uh, and as we look through the book, we'll read a few of these verses. So uh, the occasion for writing, OK? Uh, Paul had sent Timothy to the church to see how they were doing. So uh, we saw that uh, the they were persecuted by the Jews. They left Thessalonica, and they went away to Berea. Uh, he later on sends Timothy back to check up on the church to see how they're doing. And Timothy returns with the report. And so Paul is writing this letter uh, as a kind of an encouragement to the church based on Timothy's report to the church. Um, and uh, what is uh, interesting is that this whole letter actually is a very uh, positive letter. It's There isn't much uh, rebuking. So uh, we saw that also with the book of Philippians, the letter to the Philippians, that it was a very positive letter. Even here, we'll see that in First Thessalonians. In Second Thessalonians, there's a little bit of correction, but it's still not uh, about uh, like how we see in First and Second Corinthians. There's a lot of sin. There's a lot of uh, culture that has come into the church, uh, the outside culture that has influenced the church. We don't see that in these books. OK, so uh, some of the main things that he'll cover is um, the sorrow of the Thessalonians over departed saints and uh, some of the false accusations that had come against him. Um, the letter was written from Corinth. So while Paul was in Corinth, uh, he writes this letter around AD 51. So it's one of the earliest epistles that were written. Uh, and some of the unique features, uh, it talks a lot about the second coming of Christ. So uh, a lot of information about the rapture is included in First Thessalonians. Um, it also has no quotations from the Old Testament. And it's also a very simple letter. It has doesn't have a lot of theology like some of uh, Paul's other epistles. Um, the theme of First Thessalonians, uh, Christian life in relation to the second coming. So that is the main focus we'll see both in First and Second Thessalonians, a focus on the second coming of Christ. Uh, why do you think that uh, Paul is focusing on that, considering what we read in Acts 17? Why do you think Paul would be focusing on the second coming of Christ in these letters? You get a clue from the key word that's written there as well. So, uh, you want to say just that uh, we were uh, earlier discussing about uh, how people were uh, very being discomforted with regard to the loss of their uh, loved ones. Yes. I think. So when you're saying about comfort, it's about, you know, the assurance of the second coming of the Lord and the people who have died will rise again. Yeah. So uh, specifically to do with persecution. Uh, so we read in Acts 17 uh, that there was persecution that arose when the gospel was preached and Paul and Silas had to leave because of that, right? So that persecution continued to be present in the church. Now, we don't know if a lot of these deaths that happened were a result of the persecution. Uh, but uh, Paul is using uh, the second coming of Christ to comfort the people to say that uh, whatever you're experiencing here, the suffering you're experiencing here, is temporary. Christ is going to return. And so you can continue steadfast in your faith now, 
knowing that Christ is coming back and he is going to rescue us uh, from all that we have suffered. Um, so we'll just read this. If someone can read First Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10, that's the contains some of the main things that First Thessalonians talks about. First Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 9. For they themselves declare concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. Verse 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to came. Okay. So uh, some key things. They turned away from their idols. They waited for Christ's return. Um, uh, and uh, believing that Jesus will rescue them from the uh, tribulation that is to come or the wrath that is to come against those who do not believe. Okay, so we'll see a little bit of that contrast in the book between those who believe and those who don't believe. Um, first, could, uh, so First Thessalonians, some of the uh, books we can compare it to. First Corinthians 15 uh, talks about how uh, living believers will be transformed at Christ's return. Right in the twinkle of an eye, our bodies will be transformed when Christ comes back. First Thessalonians, on the other hand, talks about how the dead will be raised uh, when Christ returns. So uh, First Thessalonians focuses on those who died in Christ. Uh, Philippians and uh, Philemon, uh, along with First Thessalonians, are very um, positive letters. So there's no uh, nothing that is um, rebuking, nothing that is controversial. It's all very uh, appreciative of the churches to which they're written. Um, Second Thessalonians and First Thessalonians. Uh, so First Thessalonians explains why those who died in Christ won't miss out on the rapture. And 2 Thessalonians talks about why believers won't be in the tribulation. So the tribulation and rapture are two things that are covered in First and 2 Thessalonians. So we'll just look at an outline. So all of these letters are quite small. So uh, there's just a little bit that we have to cover. Uh, it begins in chapter 1 with the usual greeting to the church. Then it starts to talk about the church itself, the church uh, at Thessalonica. Uh, talks about, he praises the church. Uh, he talks about the church as an example. If we can read uh, uh, chapter 1, verses 4 to 5. First Thessalonians 1, 4 to 5. First Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4. Knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. Verse 5. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of man we were among you for your sake. Okay, so here it's talking about how when they preached the gospel, there was a deep conviction. The people who responded, like we read in Acts 17, uh, a large number of the God-fearing Greeks came to faith. Uh, so there was deep conviction. There was a move of the Holy Spirit uh, that came when they preached the gospel there. Uh, and the church became imitators of Paul. They saw Paul's life and they started to live the way Paul and Silas were living. Um, then 8 to 10 is where he talks about the church's uh, example of how they were living out their faith and how their faith itself had been uh, so powerful that other uh, cities and other churches in Macedonia had heard about their faith and had heard about this church. Um, in chapter 2, he talks about his relationship to the church. Uh, so first he begins with his own 
uh, ministry. He talks about how his ministry was one that was done in honesty, in righteousness, uh, with a true uh, concern for them, like a father cares for the uh, for his children. So he uses both the language of father and mother, uh, being concerned as a parent for the church. Um, the second he talks about is how the church responded to him. Uh, the church accepted him even in the midst of their suffering. In, even in the midst of their persecution, they accepted and received him and Silas. Um, the third part, he talks about his concern for the church. So uh, this is why Timothy is sent to check on how the church is doing. He wants to make sure that they have continued to remain in the faith because he knows of the persecution that they've been facing. Um, and he encourages them to continue to remain steadfast. And so that he ends with a prayer for the church here. Um, the next part uh, is titled The Problem of the Church. But if we read through uh, these chapters, we'll see that Paul is not really correcting them. He's only saying, I know you already know this, but I want you to grow in it more. Okay, so it's um, there isn't clear evidence that the church was in sin or practicing anything that was sinful. Rather, he's just encouraging them to continue to walk in purity, continue uh, to walk in the way that they are walking. So the things he addresses here are sexual purity, uh, social conduct, so loving one another. Uh, working, so that is one thing we'll see repeated even in Second Thessalonians, making sure they are working for a living, that they're not uh, just remaining idle, and through their work to be witnesses to people outside the church. Um, then he talks about, this is where we see uh, the teaching on uh, the rapture, so maybe we can read that, State of the Christian Dead, uh, chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, if someone can read that for us. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. Thank you. So, um, so this is the teaching on the rapture itself, uh, specifically to do with those who have already died. Uh, so they were... Uh, very sorrowful over the the people within the church who had died. Uh, this is possibly uh, or probably actually uh, related to persecution. And so he's comforting them with these words. Uh, and then from here, he says, OK, the dead will be raised in Christ, and we too will be caught up with them. And then he goes into chapter 5 to say, how should we live in light of Christ's return. Uh, so Christ is coming, but we have to continue to walk in holiness until the time that Christ comes. Um, then uh, in chapter 5, he also addresses church officers, and then he closes with a final exhortation and conclusion. Um, we will just read verses 23 and 24 of chapter 5. Someone can read that for us. May God uh, verse himself. 23. Now may the Lord God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful who also will do it. Thank you. So uh, we see on these verses um, sort of like a 
a summary of what he talks about. So one aspect of Christ's coming is the hope that we have in the midst of our suffering. Uh, the second aspect is that we continue to walk in holiness, that we uh, allow the Holy Spirit to continue to sanctify us and uh, we walk in that uh, holiness until Christ's return. Uh, so with that, we come to the end of First Thessalonians. Uh, Second Thessalonians builds on what First Thessalonians talks about. Uh, so uh, this letter is sent out. The first, uh, the first letter is sent out to the church, and then there are certain issues that rise up in the church. Uh, basically, that they have misunderstood a few things that Paul has talked about. So he further explains them in the second book, um, and mostly about the day of the Lord and the tribulation. Uh, again, we see that Paul, Silas, and Timothy are named as the writers of the letter. And at the end of the letter, Paul writes his greeting with his own hand. Um, this letter is again written in AD 51. So just a few months after that first letter is written, he writes this letter to explain what he had written in the first letter. Uh, the same written to the church at Thessalonica. And the theme here is fully focused on the day of the Lord. Okay, so uh, First Thessalonians also focuses on holy living. Uh, and But this letter is specifically focused on uh, the rapture and tribulation. So if someone can read this for us, Second Thessalonians 1, 6 to 10, that's kind of the main part of what the book talks about god is just he will pay back trouble to those who trouble you and give relief to you uh, who are troubled and to us as well this will happen when the lord jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels uh, he will punish those who do not know god and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shout out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. This includes you because you believe the, our testimony to you. Thank you. So um, here, continue teaching on the persecutors and the persecuted, right? So with Christ's coming, uh, those who are persecuting the church will be paid back uh, for their unbelief, and the church will be rewarded for their faith. Uh, so this is the encouragement that he is giving the church in Second Thessalonians. Uh, and uh, we'll see that um, these believers actually there was some teaching that had come into the church saying Christ has already come back. So in their mind, it was that the rapture has already happened. Uh, but Paul is writing here to tell them that uh, don't believe anyone who says anything like that. When Christ comes, we will all know. Uh, and here he describes some of the things that will happen before Christ's return. And he talks about the Antichrist coming. So um, an outline of the letter, it begins with the en with encouragement. So that's what we read. Uh, praise for the church, um, God's judgment over the wicked and reward for the church. And then he prays for the church at the end of this chapter. Uh, in chapter two, we see uh, detail about the Antichrist coming. Uh, so maybe we can read that. Chapter 2, verses 1 to 12. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our being gathered to him, we ask you, brothers and sisters, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by the teaching allegedly from us, whether by a prophecy or by word of mouth or by letter asserting that the day of the Lord has already come. Do not let anyone deceive you in any way, 
for that day will not come until the rebellion occurs and man of and the man of lawlessness is revealed the man doomed to destruction he will oppose and will exalt himself over everything that is called god or is worshiped so that he sets himself up in god's temple proclaiming himself to be god don't you remember that when i was with you i used to tell you these things and now you know uh, what what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way and then the lawlessness uh, and the lawless one will be revealed whom the lord jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming the coming of the lawless one will be in the in accordance with how satan works he will use all sorts of displays of power through signs and wonders that serve the lie and all the ways that wickedness deceives those who are perishing they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved for this reason god sent them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness thank you so uh, here paul is correcting some wrong teaching that had come into the church and clarifying what he said in his first letter so he was talking about the rapture happening uh, and they thought that the rapture had already happened so he's telling them don't uh, don't be deceived this is what needs to happen before christ returns and then he talks about the antichrist coming um after that he goes into a little bit of teaching uh this is again to encourage the believers to continue in their faith although they are being persecuted uh he talks about the judgment that is to come against those who are persecuting them and he uh, encourages them to walk in the truth to continue to walk in faith um he closes with a warning against idol believers we see this repeated again from first thessalonians again in second thessalonians here he focuses a little bit more on it and then uh, closes with a greeting so uh, both of these epistles focus on um, christ's return that is the major theme in these two books uh, so to help them keep their eyes on jesus who is coming back and to help them recognize that their present day lives should be lived with that view in perspective that christ is coming back so whether it's in suffering or whether it's walking in holiness both those things should be lived in the light of christ's return uh, so that's the end of second thessalonians um we can stop here if anyone has any questions thoughts uh you're welcome to share Uh, sure, Brother Warren, you can go ahead. Uh, yes, it says, it's, uh, unfortunately, it's not, not to do with what we've just learned. It's, um, it's out of context. Uh, just wanted to ask a question about uh, Easter. I've heard, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, as believers, a lot of people call it Resurrection Day. And, uh, the, you know, because of the uh, pagan connotation to Easter. But, I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of believers also use Easter, so I, I was just I was just wondering what what is correct and what is not, if it's okay to ask this now. Okay, uh, let me just repeat your question. Uh, so uh, you've heard um, people referring to Easter as Resurrection Sunday, right? And uh, basically saying that using Easter is like a wrong or inappropriate way to talk about um the yeah they, that's right because they were saying that easter is linked to the pagan Esther 
you know that sort of thing and and it, it, i mean it's been circulating social media for years so yes uh so um yes it is linked to uh to a pagan goddess and so when uh, people came from that worship of uh, of that god to faith in christ they replaced that festival uh with uh, a celebration of the resurrection but they kept the same name of easter uh so a lot of people say um it's better to call it resurrection sunday so we i think we're in this in between phase of um there's still a large group of people who still refer to it as easter um and so if you say resurrection sunday or resurrection day uh, they may not even know exactly what you're talking about they may not recognize that you're talking about easter um i wouldn't say that it's like it's wrong in terms of morally wrong or it's not a it's not something that is sinful um resurrection day definitely gives a better description of what we're celebrating um if you're saying easter um since it refers to that god uh, since it refers to a pagan god and since uh, it doesn't really describe what we're celebrating um resurrection day may be a better way to uh, refer to it uh, but in terms of right and wrong um, there's nothing wrong in terms of like morality uh, if you refer to it as easter is what i would say um yes that's and also um easter is a little more familiar to people outside the church as well so uh, again if we're referencing resurrection sunday that may not be something that uh, other people understand is easter is that that's that's really good thank you very much because i mean i, I had a similar understanding that you know when we can refer to it when we as resurrection sunday when we're talking to believers Yes. but the wider the wider audience i mean uh, who, who are not familiar with it will will find it a bit odd so it's okay to refer to it as easter i mean you know when we're talking to why uh, the other other uh, wider audience i would say yes uh, and Thank a lot so much, no problem um i think um yeah the main thing is to i mean to uh, even whoever we're talking to be able to share what is the true message uh, behind it or what is the true hope that we are celebrating uh, that's the main thing uh, that we want to be highlighted uh, so the words that we use uh, may be different but the message that we are communicating in it uh, is important um yeah any other <laughs> questions thank you brother sister is the falling away refer to the rapture of the church uh the what sorry uh, sister falling away falling away is it yeah uh, does it refer to rapture of the church um uh, is that from one of the verses we read yeah uh can you give me the reference sorry uh about the antichrist you know we read that in that the falling away is it refers to the rapture of church i'm not sure uh i don't think so i okay let me just um so in second uh, this is in second thessalonians second thessalonians yes. okay uh so it says here um maybe uh, okay so talks about the antichrist coming uh talks about um verse 6 now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time uh for the secret power of lawlessness is already at work but the one who holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way is that what you are referring to Uh, no sister there was a falling away okay 
um, I don't think uh, it's referring to the rapture. It's after this um, that he uh, talks about it. So he says, um, uh, so it's talking about judgment on those who are wicked uh, after the lawless one is re uh, revealed. Uh, and before that, it's saying, um, yeah, so it's basically saying that Christ has not returned. Before Christ returns, uh, the Antichrist must come. And this is how the Antichrist will come. And he talks about that and then talks about the judgment uh, that will follow uh, once the once he returns, once the Antichrist comes, uh, Christ will return and uh, there will be judgment on the wicked. Uh, so this uh, specifically is not talking about the rapture, um, but verse 6 and 7, uh, one of the interpretations of that is that um, the church is the one that is holding back uh, the coming of the Antichrist. And when the church is raptured is when this judgment will happen. Uh, and so that is where it mentions the rapture. It is, yeah, it is in the second uh, Thessalonians, second chapter. It says here, mm, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. This is the one I was showing. The rebellion yeah. occurs and the man will... Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, uh, I, uh, this is talking about uh, the Antichrist himself rebelling. And then he talks about how he will rebel. He will oppose, he will exalt himself over everything that is called God. Um, and that is how he will be revealed as the Antichrist. So the re rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is revealed. Okay. Okay, sister. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Um, any other questions? Anything you would like to share or? OK, uh, in that case, we can close. And I'll see you all on Thursday. And I'll also let you all know once the video, uh, once I post the video. Thank you. Thank you, sister.